let's get this panel started. I see Renzo is here to help me out. Yeah, I'm, I'm helping. I see Leo is connected. I'm here. Hello. Thank you. Ben, you are you here see. with us? I heard the oh, microphone unmuting. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yay. Yes. There we go. Welcome, yeah, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start off with an icebreaker for you, Ben. Um, so do you have anything interesting or curious or quirky you'd like to share about your surroundings or about what you've been doing recently? Uh, recently, I've been following down the paper trail of papers behind the mini Canon, which has been really interesting. So I've been thinking a lot about streams and, and things that I feel sort of like a dog watching TV, like, yeah, it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating, but I'm kind of, I feel like I don't fully get it yet, but it's also interesting to see how it all connects and congeals together and how, for example, the implementation of streams there connects with Leo's work and how that connects with reactive streams, which I also briefly mentioned in my talk. Sometimes it's feel, it feels like it's all connected. So. <laughs> <laughs> what about the what about the little books? Do you still do you have it already? The little book. The little books, like the little schemer, the, the little. Oh no, uh, no, but uh, okay. not yet. This this one. Oh, okay. Hello. Okay, okay. Let's prepare for that. Thank you. That was an an interesting book to share. <laughs> um, same question for Leo. Um, it, is there anything like interesting you want to share? Any or well, any um, item or? I'm going to share something about uh, my environment. Uh, yeah. So it's a prop that has been on my desk for many years now. Here it is. So it's, uh, it's a paperweight that I use as a rubber deck. So it's not made of rubber and it's not a deck, but um, it's watching me all the time and it's it's been a very good compiler so far. <laughs> nice or or creepy, <laughs> depending. Maybe it's uh is is sending you energy, I guess. <laughs> Ooh. The the spirit of uh, Minerva <laughs> is giving you some of her wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, let's uh, let's start off with a question for Ben. Um, I think you've actually answered a little bit of this already in the Discord channel. So um, Jack, Jack was asking about um, he's used the async profiler and flame and flame graphs, but like found it quite hard to interpret. And I imagine there's kind of like a, kind of a lot of experience or or other specific te techniques you can use to actually understand the results of all this like performance and profiling. Yeah, one thing to understand about performance tools in general that like any tool, you need to uh, both get some experience with them and you develop intuition as you go along. And you also need to like get things wrong sometimes, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, unless you do the wrong stuff and get bad results or results that don't make sense, you won't know when you're doing the right stuff. So it's usually enough to go over the, the documentation and there's a lot of documentation both regarding uh, CLJ async profiler and, uh, and flame graphs. Brandon Gregg has done incredible work on it and he keeps on writing and providing material. And the, the theory of flame graphs is not, uh, it's not exclusive to that work in particular. You, you can find many instances of tools and and documentation for flame graphs today. So yeah, it's it's just experience and just use it until you get comfortable with it. And if not, you can always open issues to any of the respective repositories, ask questions, because the, I, I can say that, for example, on CLJ Async Profiler, Alexander Yakushev is very responsive to, uh, to issues. So he's happy to, to answer any questions. Okay, and and just a quick follow on from that. When um, so when you are trying to interpret results, is is it is, can it be very REPL driven, or is it something you kind of need to go away and think about a little bit more about how best to tackle things? It depends both on the nature of the problem and <clears throat> on the degree of intuition you develop for that particular problem. And this always reminds me uh, back in college when 
we started learning quantum mechanics and the lecturer told us, uh, he shown us the results of some example and he said, well, this should make you uncomfortable and you should have no idea why this happens. And you also have no intuition for it yet. But as you get used to it and you get, and you start swimming in the material and in the mindset, you do get used to it. So at the beginning, you might need some, you know, hammock time or walk time or whatever you do to process the ideas. But later you'll, you'll recognize or learn to recognize some behaviors or some pathologies and you'll be able to just make a, like a, a snap uh, identification when you look at the flame graph and you say, oh, this stack looks really weird. I want to look at it. And like, why am I using reduce one, for example, or why am I dispatching via the wrong protocol, which I didn't expect? Okay. Oh yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that's very useful. Thank you very much. So we can get to our first question for Leo as well. So um, I'm going with Jakub that, by the way, shouts to uh, Jakub for making so many interesting questions. So it's very active. Thank you. Um, do I interest right? Uh, do I do I understand right that the functional effect system is quite similar to promises, where a thunk is a promise, par is a promised all, and bind is a dot then. But while promises start execution when created, thunks only start that hit lazily when asked for their value. Am I completely off? So. Um... Jakub, you're not completely off. Um, promises and effects are similar but different. So as you said, um, thunks are lazy. So when you declare a thunk, it doesn't run it. It runs only when you call for it. Uh, the other difference is filters are memoized. And thunks uh, run uh, whenever you call it them. So when you uh, ask for the results for a feature, it doesn't rerun the results. But, uh, otherwise, that um, they both describe uh, an asynchronous result. Thank you. Hopefully, it was uh, um, explanatory for, for Jakub. OK. Um, yeah, so I guess I have a question to Ben about um, if somebody's like starting, there's a lot of really interesting uh, things you've covered. And you said kind of building up experience is quite important. But if you're starting from day one, I mean, is, is things like time and criteria um, criteria useful place to start? Do they Are they a nice gateway, to, gateway drug almost to kind of lead on to the more interesting and more insightful uh, tools that you've got? Well. Uh, let's say when you're getting started and let's say this is a new application, don't profile, don't benchmark anything, develop your application. And once you have a living, breathing application and you have solved all the rest of your, the problems such as you know, blocking and the implementation details, then you should profile it. And if you, uh, let's say, meet your KPIs, go drink milkshake. Don't bother. <laughs> really, don't, don't don't waste time shaving nanoseconds off an application that meets its requirements. But it, it is uh, it is good to at least have some profiling results of the application for when you might need them later. But don't go running uh, to to optimize it before you need to. And once you do need to, then you need to start with, for example, generating a flame graph, uh, connecting to it with Visual VM to get a, to, it's like um, studying animals. You, you don't want to study them on an operating table. You want to study them in the wild. And, and then when you, when you get a, a good picture of the, uh, moving bits, bits and pieces and the uh, hot paths and the pathologies inside the application, then you can focus on them. And then it might be the time to, uh, to take a specific bit of code and a specific bit of sample input and then use Criterium and to get the initial baseline benchmarks, try an optimized implementation and compare them. 
but you don't just go around with the hammer of criterion and <laughs> <laughs> and start beating around your functions because you'll be uh, it can get addictive so <laughs> i can recommend against starting there that's very wise advice thank you very much so going back to Lionel, um i wanted to ask you one question so i think i briefly and is for me uh, i think i briefly saw um, on your slides, the AMB operator, and you also mentioned the previous heart. Um, I just wanted to you know, showcase that also um, Jerry Sassman on like uh, a design, um, software design for flexibility, um, is talking about the AMB operator. I just wanted to understand if uh, that is possibly the same. He's mentioning McCarthy and uh, is quite interesting operator there's like a, a long um a long explanation and it's quite interesting what it can do but it's very simple i just wanted to understand if we're talking about the same thing thank you well um i cannot give a definitive answer because i've not read this book yet but um it's from the same author uh, as sicp so i guess it's the same idea the inspiration for the um, operator that I, I described is from a um, book from this man. So I guess it's the same. It's probably the same. Thank you. Alrighty, I'm going to take a question from Renzo. Actually, there's a few questions that Ben's been uh, answering in Discord, which is great. We might go revisit them later on. But uh, Renzo was asking uh, about mechanical sympathy and if you have any thoughts about the JDK 16 uh, introducing vector operations and how Clojure could take advantage of uh, SIMD, single instruction, multiple data. Uh, yes, or uh, affectionately called uh, CMD back when we worked at, uh, and when I worked at Intel. Um, the most mechanical sympathy problems in Clojure are usually solved by just using backing arrays which the core collections already do wonderfully. And if you look at the vector uh, API JEPs, you'll see that they're mostly focused on numerical operations. And most operations we do in Clojure are collection oriented and data oriented and less numerically oriented. So while you can get some improvement there. I don't see how. Yes, it's it's nice. You can do a lot with it, but there's a lot of ground to cover before you can connect that to collections. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. I think uh, I I see it's quite like uh, low level, and. Um... I mean, if there are operations that can be actually parallelized in that way, they are very deep into the compiler. There might be bitwise operations, or you know, they might happen inside the implementation of core collections, but definitely requiring some work. But I was thinking maybe um, to take advantage of that part somehow as a library, uh, but I still don't know how to produce anything useful with that. So you know, just very interested in that topic. If you want to... Um, to get a peek or a window into how that can interact with the JVM. There is a discussion in the SIMD JSON library uh, regarding that exactly, using the SIMD API for the JVM and parsing JSON in relatively high throughput. There's mm -hmm. a thread in the, uh, in the library there you can read the, read the discussion. I think it, it's kind of um, stuck in, dead in the water in the meanwhile, but it will probably pick up steam in the future again. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for remembering that. And I remember that the, 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 the fastest JSON parser in the world is using exactly those techniques, written in C, of course, and assembly, <laughs> whatever. Uh, and uh, yeah, it would be nice to like, um, yeah, as an exercise to bring that into pure Java. It, will, it won't be as fast, but it will be decently fast. All right, thank you, uh, Ben. Um, 
so I'm gonna now uh, keep talking and uh, uh, asking you another. Oh, so this question for was for you already. So yes, I'm gonna pass it back to John. Sorry, I was confused by me being the <laughs> the, the question maker. Um, did you have a question for Leo Renzo on our Yeah, slide there you door? go. That's why I'm confused. I should <laughs> ask the question to Leo, and I was asking to Ben. Um, yes. Yes, sorry for that, sorry for the confusion. Yeah, so um, we have another question from Jakob. Um, so how does missionary compare to Chorusync and its channels? Is it an alternative or do they have different use cases? Well, um, how does it compare to Core Async? Um, I'm going to start with the similarities. Uh, so they both, uh, implement this um, inversion of control syntax that looks like async await uh, and they use uh, both the same technique to achieve that. Um, regarding the use cases, they can be both to uh, implement uh, streaming. The uh, channels support back pressure, uh, missionary support back pressure in another way, but it's um, there is overlap in the promise space. Uh, now they are, they are fundamentally different because uh, it's not the same paradigm. Uh, core async is much more imperative. It's also much less constrained. So there are many things you can you have to do yourself. Uh, you have no supervision in core async. Um, that means you, in general, you have to program defensively because uh, if your go block throws an exception, then you need to put it into a channel somewhere. Um, so in missionary, you get all of that for free, and the price you pay for that is you. The, the style is more constrained. You you cannot spawn a process uh, at hey, whenever you want. You have to compose effects together. Okay. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's, it's not the same uh, programming style. Okay. Thank you for your explanation. Uh, back to you, John. Ben, I think you've already asked answered this question in Discord. I just wondered if, if you had anything else to say. So somebody was asking what mini Karen. Uh, uh, can run it is and how's it connect to stream programming is that something you want to comment on yes um mini canron is the logic programming library written originally in scheme by william bird and it is also the work behind core logic if you've ever used it and also the reason i am programming in lisp today because i was inspired by Bird's talk at the Papers with Love uh, channel, and that, that's how I ended up uh, here. But the, the interesting thing regarding streams with Mini Canron is that you need some method to implement a search of the option space when you're doing logic programming. And the way it is implemented is, uh, think about it as a sort of fair list comprehension. Because if you, for example, have two infinite lists of options, you need a way to fairly interleave them to search the option space. Otherwise, you might diverge delving into one stream. So you need both um, fair streaming, fair interleaving, and fair uh, interweaving, uh, which allows you to backtrack the, the search in case it fails. And that is based on Oleg Kislyov's work on the logic monad and he also did a lot of work on streams and operator fusion and if you read his paper on operator fusion it fi you find it looks just like transducers which is amazing excellent <laughs> yeah that's a lot of fascinating work there i'm just curious did, did you have any questions ben that you wanted to ask leo while you're here um well i i I kind of uh, have been pestering Leo with questions for a while now, but <laughs> um, I, I, I do wonder if there are already any um, user reports and from people using Hyperfiddle, uh, not Hyperfiddle, sorry, that, that hopefully will come in the future too, but people using Missionary in production because I want to start using it actually. Well, um, that's the problem with open source, you never know. Um, so I I, I'm not aware of any um, explicit feedback that um, says, uh, it's using production, but um, it's definitely designed for production and it's uh, mature enough now to be. I think it's, there are some bugs uh, that need to be fixed um, right now before, um, because there are still some 
edge cases that are not well defined. And if we're not aware of them, then uh, we're going to have unexpected behavior uh, at different times. So that's the main uh, thing that I want to fix before seeing uh, its production rate. So that's going to happen very soon. Uh, I'm pretty clear with that. All of, basically, all of what I, I want to fix before uh, switching the production flag are listed in GitHub EC. So we can uh, look at that. And if you have specific questions, feel free to ask. Uh, one final question, actually, regarding missionary, which I just thought of during your talk. Uh, do you have any intent or plans to implement um, either the sequence or reduce uh, interfaces from core closure on flows? Because currently, it reduces. Uh, you have your own implementation of reduce, and it is a bit ad hoc. But if you implemented the reduce interface, you could reduce and transduce overflows immediately. What would be the benefit compared to what's existing now? That you could use core closure reduce. Oh, you mean with um, uh, with a blocking reduction function? For example, yeah. Because the purpose of flow is to be async. So if you want to use closure reduce to reduce overflow, then you you need to leverage threads. To block until the, the values become available. Um, I have an implementation for that uh, that relies on iterable, Java long iterable. Um, I've not decided if I want to add it in core, it would be uh, Java only, that's for sure. Um, but I can show you if you want uh, later, if that's useful to you, uh, let, let me know. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you both for that. That was very, uh, very interesting. Uh, Ryan, so is there another question for Leo? What is your long-term goal with Missionary and is there a killer app? What's my long-term goal with Missionary? Um, I consider Missionary to be close to done and I don't expect it to grow much. I, uh, I think it's a good foundation and uh, the idea is to build other things on top of that, not to grow the library itself. Um, it's built on two fundamental protocols that don't depend on Missionary. So if you want to uh, make something useful that is compatible with missionary, uh, it can be a separate library. So uh, the idea is to make an ecosystem grow around the, these two uh, fundamental protocols. So that's uh, the first part of the question. Now, is there a killer app? The original motivation for it was uh, user interfaces. So I would say in, in the front end, the, the goal is to have a better foundation to, to make better user interfaces with uh, proper incremental maintenance and fine-grained reactivity. Um, it's still uh, pretty much low, low level to make UI, but um, it's a good foundation. Um, on the backend side, uh, I would say it's, the, um, it's a useful tool to implement um, uh, distributed algorithm, for instance, because um, in this problem space, you spend your time uh, dealing with errors, uh, retrying stuff, sending uh, value asynchronously, uh, deal with time, stuff like that. So you need uh, the right basis, you need supervision, you need that, that kind of stuff. So I would say that would be the main uh, use cases. Thank you. So with that, I think we um, arrive at the end of the questions that we collected so far. So thanks everyone for asking nice questions uh, to our speakers. As usual, thanks a lot of thanks to uh, Leo and Ben uh, for bringing their wisdom and putting the effort into um, uh, in their talks today. Um, it was very interesting topics uh, so far and the entire like a UK morning. Um, thanks again. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for being here at the QA panel. Mm -hmm.